welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Cambridge, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Grant. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I am in Cambridge recording this because I just finished the second of four half marathons that I'm doing in the course of four weeks to support HIV AIDS orphans in India. Uh, you can uh, learn more about this at heavensgate.greatdetectives.net. Uh, the race I ran in um, on October 15th when this is being recorded was the Rush Creek Stampede. And if you are into half uh, marathons and like uneven pavement and beautiful scenery, a lot of hills, this is definitely a race for you. It was a very challenging course to say the least. Uh, full details, though, on why I'm running at heavensgate.greatdetectives.net. But now we're going to take a look at Nightbeat. Um, in today's episode of Nightbeat, we're going to start the series off um, by showing how Nightbeat could have been different. Uh, there are audition recordings for many beloved uh, radio programs that are vastly different from what ended up going to air. Uh, those who know Nightbeat, they think of uh, Frank Lovejoy playing Randy Stone. But it actually began with uh, Edmund O'Brien playing reporter Hank Mitchell. And this never went to air, but we're going to play the audition for you. The date for the audition is May the 19th of 1949, and the title is The Ted Carter Murder Case. The National Broadcasting Company presents Night Beat, starring Edmund O'Brien as Hank Mitchell. <laughs> Hank Mitchell's the name. The guy who writes that column buried somewhere in the middle section of your examiner. In case you haven't discovered it, well, it's a lot like anybody's life. Sometimes it mutters around like an old man absently looking for his pipe. Sometimes it can start out frolicking like birds on a Sunday morning and then turn up with a corpse in a dark alley. The corpse in the dark alley is the business at hand. In a big city, a dead man is a pretty impersonal thing. But this one... I had a special interest in because they wanted me to identify it. It was early morning when I walked into the county morgue and there was that same familiar ammonia smell stinging my nostrils, the usual gleaming tile, and the empty feeling you get when the cold swipe of the morgue hits you across the face like the tail end of a nightmare. The police lieutenant was waiting for me. He nodded for the attendant to pull back the white sheet. Well? Yeah, that's him. That's Ted Carter. Ted Carter. And as the attendant pulled the sheet back up over him, I couldn't help feeling that no matter who they might say killed Ted, the one who'd really put him under that canvas sheet was me. I'd known Ted since we were kids, growing up in the same block of tenements, only I took to banging on a typewriter while Ted started hanging around with the bad boys. We still managed to see each other through the years, and whenever we got together, I never lost the chance to make noble sounds about Ted going straight. Because he liked me, he started listening to me. And so, because he listened, he was lying on a slab. I turned to the lieutenant. He was looking at his pocket watch and yawning. We had to get positive identification, Hank. You were the only one we could reach. Sorry I got you out of bed. No, it's okay. Well... I guess that winds it up. Be seeing you. Thanks for the trouble. Hey, wait a minute. What's your hurry? You act like you never knew the kid. Sure, I knew. So what? I know lots of people. Stuck his neck out for you more than once. Saved your face a couple of times that I remember. I know you had a friendly interest in the kid, Hank, but no, he got it the way all hoodlums eventually get it. He's been going straight and you know it. Well, what are you sore about? Well, who did it? Who killed him? Go in any book joint, any gym mill, look in any back alley, any flop house. Whoever you find there could have done it. Take your pick. Take my pick. Nobody talks, Hank. Nobody remembers anything. No clues, but a lot of suspects. Uh, in my book, it's murder by a person of persons unknown. Hmm. Just like that. Just like that. 
Well, maybe for you it's that way, Lieutenant. But not for me. I walked away from the lieutenant like he had the smallpox and I'd never been vaccinated. When I hit the street, it was raining. The sky was gray. There was a cold chill in the air. I waited for a cab, thinking for the first time that I hated this city. Hated it because somewhere out in that rain was Ted's killer. What was he doing now? Sleeping? Having his morning coffee? Waiting for the first editions to come out to see how well he'd done? You'd have to look hard to find anything about Ted. Page six, ex-hoodlum found shot, period. When you're an ex-anything, that's a nice way of saying, you're dead, brother. Lie down. When a cab showed up, I went over to see Ted's girl, Joan. As soon as she opened the door, I knew she'd found out. Her face looked pinched and pale. Her eyes were red like she'd squeezed out that last tear. They called me from the police station. Yeah. Why did it have to happen like that? What do you think did it, Joan? I don't know. He told me he was all through with the racket. What was he doing? Who had he been mixed up with? He never told me anything. I never asked him. I believed him when he told me he was going straight. I'm going to find out who killed him, Joan. You and Ted lived in different worlds. He wouldn't want you to get hurt because of him. He believed me when I told him he'd be happier if he went straight. That's a nice thing to keep me company from now on, huh? But this is for the police, Hank. Sorry, the police aren't interested. Oh, but Hank, Who was the, the last I... guy he worked for, Joan? Who got sore when Ted decided to quit, huh? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> didn't know. I went around to the old haunts, his former friends. They didn't know. The district attorney didn't know. The cops didn't know. Ted had kicked around in this city among all these people for 28 years, and now, suddenly, it was like he'd never lived at all. Then I remembered a little item from his old life. A little item with baby blue eyes and red hair. Laverne Clare. He'd gone with her before he met Joan. And even after he met Joan, I know he'd kept sneaking back to Laverne. Like a drunk deciding whether to spend his last coin calling Alcoholics Anonymous or buying a glass of Muscatel. I went looking for Laverne. She had the number four spot, one of those five-a-day shows on the untidy side of town. When I got there, I had to wait till the fleshy part of the entertainment was over. Then I went to a dressing room. Ted spent a lot of time telling me how crazy he was about you, Laverne. Yeah. He was a sweet guy. Have his whole life. You like, you like to tell me about the way you looked when you danced. Yeah, sure. Hey, where's my drink? That bottle there. Hmm? Poem, you will you? Oh, sure. Oh. Hey, when? Uh, uh, that'll be when. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Who do you think killed him, Laverne? Look, Mr. Mitchell, you're a nice guy, so why don't you go back to your office and write your column about pretty things, Mr. Mitchell? Nice, nice, harmless things. You don't want to get mixed up with Bailey or with that guy, Jerry. They're poison, Mr. Mitchell. Why, they... Go home. Get out of here. Bailey. I didn't say Bailey. So it's Bailey. Character that parlays pinballs into diamond stick pins, numbers, racket, Bailey, huh? So Ted knew something, and he no, had a shut... No, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything. And who's this Jerry? I don't know. I don't know anything. Get out of here. I don't you understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'm beginning to understand. So I had myself a lead, George Bailey. Only, it was like going fishing with the hope you'll be lucky enough to catch a trout, but all of a sudden, look who's eating your worm, Moby Dick the whale. Before I told anyone else, I thought I'd go back and see Joan. I think I know who killed him, Joan. You do? I'm not positive, but it's the beginning. Who? George Bailey. Know him? Bailey? Who told you it was Bailey? You're getting pale, Joan. So you think it was Bailey, too? Well, listen, Hank, stay away from Bailey. He's trouble. Yeah? Well, I'll let you know exactly how much trouble. See you later. Where are you going? The lieutenant told me anyone could have killed Ted. He invited me to take my pick. Well, I'm going over and see that cop. I've taken my pick. George Bailey. Hi, 
Frank, you surprise me. You really expect me to arrest George Bailey? On what charge? He's mixed up with Ted's killing. You know it and I know it. But outside of this Laverne girl, have you got a witness? One single witness who'll testify that Bailey ever knew Ted. Now, you know nobody would testify against Bailey. But I've got to have something to go on, Hank. You have one shred of evidence pointing to Bailey. What? All right, arrest him on suspicion and then sweat it out of him. Now, wouldn't I look fine against Bailey's high-powered chaste lawyer? So what? Me trying to make an arrest stick because some drunken dame shot her mouth off. And even then, she'd deny it if I put her on the witness stand. Uh-huh. So you don't want to touch me. Oh, wait a minute. Get me one witness who saw them together. Find me one scrap of circumstantial evidence. I'll arrest Bailey in a minute. You won't find anything. I know. I've tried. All you'll find is frightened people in blank walls. Bailey's had this town by the throat for ten years. No, I'm sorry, Hank. I can't help you. But I couldn't stop. I was like a snowball. Somebody started rolling down a hill. I didn't know where I was going or what would happen when I got there, but I had to keep rolling. They've got a name for that. It's called the guilt complex, and I had it in Technicolor. Ted was dead and buried because he believed in me. I couldn't forget that any more than I could forget my name. And then I remembered my column. Sure. Why not? Why not? The stories of those happy winos would have to move over. I was going to work on Bailey in the only way I knew and keep my fingers crossed that something would happen. What big shot racketeer sends for his aspirin every time someone mentions the back alley murder of Ted Carter? When is the district attorney going to get wise and change the address of Mr. B from a downtown penthouse to an upstate dead house? Listen to this, boss. Mitchell's latest little offering. When are the police going to bring in the Carter killer? Let me see it. And if they don't know who it is, I'll give them a hint. Think of Daly and reach for the letter B. How long is he going to get away with that? And if I'm wrong, why doesn't somebody sue? Why doesn't somebody sue? Hand me the phone. Sure. Hello? I want Hank Mitchell. You got him. I'll say it only once, Mr. Mitchell. Huh? I don't like this kind of publicity. Uh-huh. I, uh... You must be Bailey. I'm asking you to lay off. Oh? Real polite, thank you. That's right. Real polite. So what's the good word, Mr. Mitchell? The good word, huh? Well, I got a whole sack full. If you get a copy of the examiner first thing tomorrow, you'll see him right under my byline. Now, listen, but Mitchell... But since you are nice enough to call, I'll give you a preview. Something like this. One of the local gendarmes going to knock on Mr. Bailey's door with a warrant for his... Okay. So he doesn't want a preview. Oh, let him pay seven cents. I got back to my rooming house a little after ten. I was feeling pretty good. That guilt complex about Ted Carter wasn't hurting quite so much. I unlocked my door and stepped inside. I didn't have to shut the door. It was shut for me. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Mitchell. Well, as long as you're here, make yourself at home. You're a wisecracker, ain't you? Like your friend, Ted Carter. What do you know about Ted Carter? <laughs> he was a regular car. Okay, what do you want? My boss sent me over to take a look at you. Your boss? Mm-hmm. Mr. Bailey. And you? Your little boy, Blue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, regular wisecracker. Tell that boss of yours I'll be dropping around to see him for an interview. Uh Uh-uh. Huh? He don't want it that way. He sent me to see you instead. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He don't like people who don't pay attention to his telephone messages. He thinks you're very nasty yapping all the time that he had something to do with the Ted Carter killing. So? So, like I said, Mr. Bailey don't like it. Okay, Buster, now get out of here. Not right now. Mr. Bailey wants me to teach you a lesson. Mr. Bailey don't like smart guys. (laughs) Wise cracker. (laughs) 
I woke up with a nice view of my ceiling. The sign outside the window flashed on and off. And every time it flashed on, it was like that punk of Bailey's with his blackjack testing his strength in my skull and doing fine. After a while, I crawled to my knees and worked my way over to the wall. And I climbed up the side of the dresser till I reached the phone. Operator. Operator, get me the police... No. No, never mind. Skip it. All of a sudden, I didn't want the police in on this. I wanted this to be a private party. All of a sudden, I was tired of the lieutenant shaking his head and saying, give me evidence. I was tired of the clatter of my typewriter and the fiery words that added up to nothing. I guess maybe it was the beating I'd taken, or maybe that guilt complex about Ted working overtime. But all of a sudden, I wanted to feel a gun in my hand. I washed up and changed clothes, found a cab. It was a quarter to eleven when I reached Joan's apartment. I had to knock a long time before she came to the door. She was rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. Oh, oh Hank, come in. Thanks, honey. What happened to you? Surprise party by the same people who surprised Ted. Wait, I'll get some bandages. That's not why I came. Huh? Ted once told me that when he decided to quit, he brought his gun to you so you could keep it and know he was on the up and up. So? I want Ted's gun. Well, what are you going to do with it? Never mind, just get me the gun. Crazy Hank, you little... The gun. Will you get me the gun? It's in the bottom drawer of the dresser. I'll get it. I think you're crazy. Here. Thanks. Now, if I can use your phone. I called the examiner and talked to a pal on the crime beat. He gave me two telephone numbers for Bailey, one at his home, one at his office. I called the home first. They told me he was still working. I called the office, and when friend Jerry answered, I hung up. Well? He's at his office, a hard-working fella. You know where it is? Sure. Wentworth Tower, skyscraper in the loop. Well... Be seeing you, Joan. Hank, you're crazy. You're walking right into a trap. They'll kill you like they killed Ted. If I don't go, Jerry will be coming around again. You see, either way, it's no good. At least this way, I say when. But Hank... Wish me luck. Luck? Oh, you fool. You'll end up like Ted with five bullet holes in your back. At the Wentworth Towers, it was almost midnight. The streets were deserted. The only sound was distant traffic. The front door of the building was locked. I looked through the glass. The only light in the lobby came from the night elevator. An old man sat inside the elevator, dozing. I pounded on the window. He looked out at me. He shook his white head for me to go away, but I wasn't going. When he saw me staying there, he got to his feet and started walking toward me. He snapped the door lock and pushed open the front door. Nobody in this building now. All the officers are closed. Not all of them, Pop. I have an appointment with Mr. Bailey. You have? Okay, I'll take you up. 34th floor. Come on. As the elevator rose, I dipped my hand in my coat pocket. The cold touch of the gun had the comforting sensation of a boy holding his father's hand. The elevator came to a stop on the 34th floor. The doors opened. And Jerry stepped out of the darkness, also with a gun, only his was in his fist. So that call tonight was from you, huh? Take us downstairs, Pop. Sure, thanks, Jerry. I want to see Bailey. Mr. Bailey made me the reception committee. Where does the reception take place? In the alley? <laughs> Maybe. And keep your hands out of your pockets. Let me see what you've got there. A oh, gun. Pretty nice. Thanks. Well, don't mention it. I'm always handing out soon. <laughs> You go out first, Pop, and open the street door. All right, Terry. I'll get it open for you. Is everything all right, Pop? Is it all clear? Why don't you go out there and see? Here, I'll help you. Hey, what? I shoved the kid out and pushed the lever that slammed the door shut and started the elevator going up. I could see little lights blink on the instrument panel as I passed each floor. Bailey was on the 34th floor, and I was getting closer. 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 
locked up. What was wrong? I kept punching the lever. Again and again. The elevator wouldn't budge. I tried to open the door, but it was sealed tight. The signals on the panel showed I was stuck between the 11th and the 12th floor. What was wrong? And I heard noises far down below. Now I knew what was wrong. Jerry and the old man had gone to the basement and switched off the power on my elevator. I didn't have to be a mastermind to figure out their next move. They'd bring up one of the other elevators and come after me. I began to feel like an animal trapped in a cage. And then I noticed the little door on top of the cage. I climbed on the old man's stool. I pushed the door upward and grabbed the sides of the opening. Then I started pulling myself out. Now, I was standing on top of the elevator, hanging onto the greasy cable that ran down from the roof of the building. And far below, I heard the other elevator with Jerry and the old man start climbing. Leaning forward, I could just about reach the door of the 12th floor. A little further, a little... Up. Almost lost my balance. The other elevator was coming fast. I'd lunged for the handle of the 12th floor door again. Got it. Pulled forward with all my strength. The door opened. Then I began pulling myself up, up through the open door and onto the 12th floor. I crouched, gasping like a fish out of water. Then, before I could move, the doors of the other elevator burst open. Okay, Mr. Wise Guy, what now? I don't know. Got any suggestions? <laughs> yeah. With all that oil on you, we're going to send you to the cleaner. Pop, you go downstairs. You better wait a while. Huh? Look down the hall. Who is it? See who's coming. So, oh. one of the cleaning women. We're going to have a witness. Hey, Pop, will you wait for me, please? Now, come on, come on. Well, this is sure a break. You being up here, Pop. <laughs> Thought you'd be taking a snooze, and I'd have to wait for heaven knows how long. No, I'm going down now. Get in. Oh, uh, what about the gentlemen here? Ain't they going down? Huh? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Huh? Uh, but we can't. I, I just remembered. Remembered what? Uh, I, I left those reports on top of the desk. Come on, we'll go back and pick them up. We can pick them up tomorrow. I want to get them now. And go yourself. I'll go down. Uh, but you heard what this lady said. It's hard to get the elevator this time of night. <laughs> down, the four of us. No one said anything. The cleaning woman was half dead on her feet, her head bobbing half asleep. That lovely, innocent, tired old gal was saving my life so long as she was with us. Then her head jerked up. She blinked at the signals on the panel. Uh, I'll get out on the third floor, Pop. I'm going to the dressing room. Right there. Here you are, number three. Thanks, Pop. Good night. Or should I say good morning? Yeah, good night, good night. Me too. I got to get off here. Oh, no, you don't. This isn't the main floor. For me, this is the main floor. Mitchell, come back here, Mitchell. I raced down the hall, past the cleaning woman who stared at me with her mouth wide open. In the distance, I saw what I was looking for, a little red sign that said stairway. My pal was right after me. When I got to the stairs, I started down four at a time. He was right in my tail. You're not getting no way, Mitchell. I had to get out of here fast. The party was getting rough. I reached the main floor, but instead of going through the lobby and into the street, I ducked behind the cigar counter. A few seconds later, the kid raced by. He went through the front door, looking for me on the street outside. I looked at the indicator over the night elevator door. The old guy was still parked in the third floor. I went to the stairs again and down into the basement. A light was burning at a desk. At the desk, a little guy in overalls was sleepily playing solitaire. I grabbed hold of a wrench and started toward him. He heard me and looked up. Hey, what do you want? One of those elevators. Which one is working? What's going on in this building? Which one of those elevators is working? Number five? All it's... right, you come with me. It... Come on. Here, this, this tool room looks all right. Come on, get inside. But listen, You I... shouldn't complain. You but... don't know how lucky you are. But... I got into the elevator and started up. I was getting to be a regular genius with these elevators, but this was going to be the end of this little game. I was finally on my way up to see Bailey. Thirty-fourth floor. The building tapered off up here. Around the small square hallway 
were six office doors. Bailey was behind one of those doors. The hallway switch was easy enough to find. I snapped off the lights. Now, if Bailey decided to start shooting, I wouldn't make such a good target. I went to the first door. Dudley and Dudley, patent attorneys, the guilt letter said. The second door was locked. Then a telephone started ringing inside one of the offices. The fifth down the hall. I hurried over to it. Locked. The transom was half open, but no light showed through. Then, as I was about to turn away, I heard... Hello? Is that you, Jerry? Good thing you called. Where the devil are you? A lot, you crazy fool. He's up here. Yes, in the hall, just outside this door. Get that night elevator and come up here right away. He's turned out the hall lights. Don't take any chances. As soon as your elevator door is open, kill him. All right, move. Now, what are your plans, Mr. Mitchell? That was a good question, Bailey. What was I going to do? I couldn't break into Bailey's office. I didn't have a gun. He'd kill me before I could turn the door knob. The indicator above the night elevator door was blinking fast. It was on its way up. The kid was in it, and the instant the door opened, he'd... he'd kill me. Right then, I started thinking of Joe. You'll end up like Ted with five bullet holes in the back. Yeah. Yeah, it was beginning to look that way. The elevator had passed the 17th floor, 18, 19. The little lights were dancing like a string of shooting stars. The kid was coming up fast. I was beginning to feel those bullets tearing into my back. You'll end up like Ted with five bullet holes in your back. I couldn't get Joan's voice out of my mind. What was I going to do? You'll end up like Ted with five bullet holes in your back. With five bullet holes in my back. His back. The elevator reached the 30th floor. I'd fought my way 34 stories to reach Bailey, and now... Now I wasn't thinking about Bailey. You'll end up like Ted with five bullet holes in your back. As the kid's elevator passed the 32nd floor, I started running for the elevator I'd brought up from the basement. I jumped into it and started down. I didn't want to kill Bailey anymore. I wanted only to get to Joan. Joan was waiting for me when I got to her apartment. She was still as upset as when I left her to get Bailey. She wanted the whole story, everything that happened. When I finished, I watched her relax. Then you didn't kill Bailey. No, Joan, I, I didn't kill Bailey. Police siren. Sounds like it's stopping in front of the house. Yeah. They came here sooner than I expected. Sooner than... You've been lying to me. You did kill him. They come to arrest you. You lied. I haven't lied, Joan. They haven't come to arrest me. Huh? They've come to arrest you. Me? For the murder of Ted Carter. What are you talking about? I didn't... Oh, but you did. You said the wrong thing tonight when I went out to get Bailey. What do you mean? You said I'd end up like Ted with five bullet holes in my back. How did you know about that? What? It wasn't in any of the newspaper stories. You never went to the morgue. There was no way on earth you could have known, unless... Unless you killed him. Be right with you. That's the police, Joan. Any more questions? I was willing to do anything for him. Scrub his floor, wash his clothes, give him a good home, anything. But always he kept going back to Laverne. The way I loved him, do you think I could let any other... Okay, boys, I'll let you in. I just want you to know one thing, Joan. No matter what you thought, Ted really loved you. You see, Laverne represented his old world. But with you, he was going to have a new life. You remember that, do you? Okay, boys, she's ready. She's all yours. That's the story of Ted Carter. Murdered in the name of love. Okay. That's what love does to you. I'll string along with Peanut. Uh, I guess I'm just feeling low tonight. Because murder is only a symptom of what we're suffering from. The disease is selfishness and jealousy and greed. Too many of us have decided that the golden rule may have been all right for Grandpa, but nowadays the fashionable thing is dog eat dog. That I think, how can that be? How can any of us hurt or hate or 
even be indifferent to those around us. When in this whole crazy world, all, all any of us ever really have is each other. Well, that does it for tonight. Nice job. You finish up, yell for the copy boy, grab for a second-hand sandwich and a tired cup of coffee, and then you start all over again. Because tomorrow you got another night beat. You don't know where the story's coming from or where it's going to take you, but you know it's, it's somewhere out there in the dark waiting for you. Tell you about it next week. Copy boy! <laughs> I've just heard the first of a new series, Night Beat, starring Edmund O'Brien. Also in our cast were Betty Moran, Jack Crucian, Ann Stone, Herb Butterfield, Gail Bonney, Jack Edwards, and Larry Dobkin. Music was by Rex Corey. Night Beat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by William P. Rousseau. Edmund O'Brien is currently co-starring with James Cagney in the Warner Brothers production, White Heat. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, as we've just uh, a couple weeks ago finished playing the new adventures of Michael Shane, I think that we can kind of hear the uh, influence of Bill Rousseau, who uh, directed this pilot, as well as the new adventures of Michael Shane and Pat Novak for Hire. It's very hard-boiled and very uh, hard-bitten in its uh, performance. Certainly, Edmund O'Brien is a good uh, actor, an Academy Award winner, and in other contexts, I've definitely uh, enjoyed his work. But the way the script is written, it just plays out a little bit too hard-boiled, and it's not really helped by the... Uh, uh, organ uh, music here, which is just overplayed. It feels kind of op like a very oppressive score. So it's kind of obvious why this was. Um, and it probably wouldn't have lasted. Uh, there were a lot of shows on there that were very hard boiled, on the radio that were very hard boiled. I think when you look at the programs that NBC did. Uh, put out or introduce, they tended to have a little bit more of a twist um, at this point rather than being uh, the t same type of uh, hard-boiled detective that had dominated radio really since uh, the mid-1940s. And so we'll get to hear this uh, story performed in the second audition, and uh, hopefully it'll begin to sound like the not beat we've heard in the preview episodes we played uh, recently. But uh, that will actually do it for today. If you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives 